and today's topic is uh, is about using pulse crops and break crops, uh, particularly pulse crops, to uh, see how many hits we can get at the weeds in, in one year. And, uh, and hopefully we can successfully hand over to Peter Butsalis to kick off his presentation and, and, uh, and tell us a bit about how he believes we can use uh, the pulse crops to get you know, multiple shots at the weeds in one year. So it's more than a double knock. It, uh, I don't know, it could be yeah, several knocks in one year of, of the same population of weeds. So I'll hand over to you, Pete, and, um, and we'll pause it periodically as we go for questions. Thank you, I'll see how we go. <clears throat> okay, very exciting uh, front page there, everyone. <laughs> That's um, now I've got to try and see how we can go to the next page. Yeah, sometimes you just have to click on the um, on the middle of the slide, Pete, and then you can use your arrow keys. Yeah, just click somewhere in the middle, and then your arrow keys should work. Okay. <coughs> okay. <coughs> yeah, excuse me, everyone. I've got a just recovering from a bit of a flu, so a bit of a hoarse voice. Um, long time ago we could use a single herbicide to control weeds as in in the, in the 80s and that was really easy and everyone thought that we had we were on top of weeds but today that really works because we've got lots of complex herbicide resistance genes floating around the whole country and so yeah that doesn't work very often so we have to take a lot of effort and tackle weeds at different growth stages to try and and get those numbers right down at the end of the season. So even in, in pulse crops, resistance is actually making things a bit of a, a challenge, but there are some opp opportunities there and there are some tactics in that whole process where we can really um, give weeds a big shock and, and get on top of them. So, you know, where we're getting a little bit unstuck is uh, in ryegrass. Resistant ryegrass is becoming a challenge even in pulse crops and uh, broadleaf weeds. So wild radish, mustard, south is a prickly lettuce, where they, I'll speak a fair bit about them, but where they're resistant, it's, it's hard to get them out of a pulse crop. So they are a real issue. So, okay, that's just a bit of a introduction. So just to, to set the scene, this is um, from our part of the country on Eastern Australia. This is what we've been finding through our GRDC funded random weed surveys where I've got the herbicides there where, which are used in pulses. And we can see in, in South Australia, trophorolin is really not working very well. Basically one in one out of two paddocks across the entire state is trophorolin resistant and it won't have much of an impact. Uh, it works a lot better in Western in Victoria, but Western Victoria we've got some issues. <clears throat> now, any herbicides are used to control in Clearfield crops to control various weeds, but th those numbers there, sorry, those numbers there indicate the percentage of paddocks in random weed survey where we had found them resistant to each of the herbicides. So, for example, Intervix, 29%. In the Mallee indicates that 29% of the paddocks where we found ryegrass in 2012, the ryegrass was intervix resistant. So there are some challenges there. Even glyphosate is through using a random approach, we are finding it occurring. And clethidem, I'll speak a fair bit about clethidem because there's lots of talk about it failing and our random weed surveys are just not showing that. We've got a lot of opportunities with clethidem and I believe in many cases, it's not resistance or it's not strong resistance that's causing the survival of ryegrass to this herbicide. But there are some other issues that if they're improved, we can get better better effect of our clethidem. So just to show you there, uh, the data from Northern Victoria in 2016, that data is just out. And that's showing there that we found 3% of the paddocks had glyphosate resistance and 4% um, of the paddocks had resistance to 250 mils of select and only 1% of the paddocks had resistance to 500 mils of select. So we're actually finding just as much glyphosate resistance in those random paddocks as clethidim. So, you know, we're not getting a lot of complaints about glyphosate, but we are of clethidim and I, I believe it's not always resistant. So just a little bit to set the scene. I know that in WA, 
strong trifluorine resistance is not very common. And so there's a lot of opportunities there. And even in New South Wales, there's not that much trophoron resistance. It's only on, on my part. But resistance to those other herbicides is, is that the data here represents the entire cropping zone, really. So I'll just move on to the next slide. <clears throat> so with um, just mention about a little bit about those weeds, in pulse crops, Indian hedge mustard is a real challenge because it's developing multiple resistance. Extensive use of IMIs has led that to change from strong resistance to sulfonylureas only to also strong resistance to IMI herbicides as well. So we've got this cross resistance between those two different um, chemical classes. So it's becoming an issue. And how do you control this weed? in a pulse crop, it's really difficult. If you look at some of the, I've got some more random weed survey data on that table. And when you're starting to get resistance to glean and intervix, it's making things, and atrazine as well, it's making things really difficult in those uh, crops. So, you know, it, it's a challenge. So that, that complex resistance is gonna make things really difficult. That's that's a one uh, main, one of the major broadleaf weeds from this part of the country. Um, South thistle is occurring everywhere. Um, in this part of Australia, we've got lots of resistance to Group B herbicides, and we are getting information about IMI resistance as well. Um, we've got a little project that's occurring now, so we want to see if there's any cross resistance between Glean and Intervix. But you know the fact that this is resistant to these herbicides means that even in Clifford crops, it's going to be very challenging to control this weed as well. As is occurring as well, we've got resistance to glyphosate in this popular in this species also. So that's going to make things really challenging if you're trying to control this weed towards the end of the season if it's glyphosate resistant. So again, something to to think about there. Uh, one of the final the final broadleaf weed is wild radish. Although we haven't got as much resistance as in the West, we are identifying some resistance to Group B herbicides. And in just other farmer directed samples that have been sent to me for resistance testing, we have got resistance to the other modes of action as well, to brodal and atrazine and 2,4-D as is occurring in the West. So it is happening here too. But these three species here are really are making things quite difficult to control in, in a pulse crop. Right. So we've got several stages during a crop's growth that weeds can be attacked in. We've got the pre-sowing, so the knockdown, double knock situation, the pre-M herbicide phase, the post-M herbicide phase, late season seed set control and the post harvest post harvest seed destruction phase. I won't be talking much about that last one because there's been a lot of information about that one recently. Okay, moving on. Let's have a look how we can tackle the, each of these phases. So pulse crops are important. We've got peas, beans, lentils, lupins and chickpeas as the main ones. They're very important because of nutritional benefits to cereal crops and also breaking diseases, root-borne diseases. They offer weed control, different herbicides that can't be used in cereals, and mainly that we're here we're looking at the, the DIM herbicides. And there are some quite aggressive crop topping options that can't be used in cereals too that are available in, in pulse crops. So we've got some other tactics that can be used to control uh, resistance. Uh, I'm trying to find this arrow always. So in the knockdown double knock phase, here we're trying to control things that have weeds that are germinated with glyphosate and or paraquat. So trying to really reduce that seed bank as much as possible before sowing, highly dependent on the season. If we get an early break, as happened this year, we were able to you know put a couple knockdowns through, get those numbers as low as possible, and hopefully try and start to uh, minimize that seed bank for the stuff that's going to germinate in, in the crop. So 
a little bit more on that one is, you know, I get asked this question a lot, and there's some work that Chris Preston did quite a while ago, but it's highly rel relative, and that is, um, you know, how do we use a double knock? The, the double knock is made is to prevent glyphosate resistance. So it's not only about tr trying to get weed control, but also to prevent any weeds, any especially ryegrass, to develop resistance to glyphosate. So what was done there was that two ryegrass, two glyphosate resistant populations, and acceptable was sprayed with glyphosate, and then paracot was sprayed one, three, five, seven, ten days later. And what happened is that if you sprayed, if you sp after spraying glyphosate, if you spray the paracot between one to five days you got complete control of the glyphosate resistant um, ryegrass populations. But after sort of, after the week, what happened is you started to get survival of those glyphosate resistant populations. And the reason there is that glyphosate is slow acting. It takes quite a while to work. So after about a week, it starts to stress the, the resistant plants, even though uh, they're resistant, they are stressed and when they're stressed there was less effect of the paraquat and those plants actually survived and would set seed um, if they weren't tackled with any other process. So one to five days as a rule of thumb after applying glyphosate to apply paraquat that way anything that's glyphosate resistant isn't starting to stress yet and should be taken out by um, yeah the paraquat. Now a grower from uh, WA a few years ago said to me, oh, he doesn't worry about that because he just goes and sprays two, two and a half litres of, of paraquat afterwards, and that's fine. He's using a very high rate of paraquat. So even if they are, if the glyphosate resistant ryegrass is stressed, that because it's such a high rate, it overcomes it and, and they're killed. But if you're using that one, 1 1.2 litre rate, then you've got to think about this um, this scenario. So Pete, can I just clarify with this piece of research, uh, what rate was the paraquat used at there? Yeah, 1.2. 1.2, yep. Yeah. And so, and did that research have higher rates and it, and it did show that if you use that two litres plus sort of thing, it, it overcame it? Not in this situation, no. Okay. No, it was just at the one rate. Righto. Okay. Um, and just everyone out there, if you've got a question, just type it into your questions box and uh, and we'll tackle it as we go. Okay, so we've had a good break for the season and we've got on top of some weeds. Now it's time to put the crop in. And um, what are we going to do with the pre-emergent herbicides? Well, there's, there's limited new mode of action herbicides, even though there are a few popping up. So that's something that has changed in the last 10 years with um, just a, a large collection of herbicides slowly coming onto the market. But at the moment, currently registered, there's not a, a huge amount. So we'll talk a little bit about um, the e efficacy of them. So resistance, as I said, in um, Trofurlan, we've got the highest in South Australia, and then Victoria, the other parts of the country, Trofurlan is still working quite well. And um, yeah, we'll just talk about more of them in a, in a second when I can move to this next page. So. This is what we have today, more or less. We've got the Trofurlan, Avidex, Box of Gold and Sakura all registered in pulses. Propizamide, even though I'm sure it is used in pulses, it's not registered in pulses. Arcade is not registered in pulses and, and other prosulfocarb products. Metazaclor, they've just been released by BASF. It's only registered in um, canola. And Altiplano, which is a herbicide that'll be onto the market next year by FMC, and um, won't have a, or highly unlikely to have a pulse registration. So, so far we've got Trofurlan, Navidex, Box Gold and Secura. There are a couple of new products that are coming onto the market soon. One is from Adama called uh, C4, and that one will have pulse registration. And um, yeah, one from FMC, F9600, which I've done a fair bit of work with, also is likely to have pulse registration as well. So it could be a, a couple of new modes of action there, which will help the situation in, in controlling our weeds. So 
you know, in the next couple of years, we'll have some new modes of actions that's making pulse crops a, a way to tackle multiple resistant um, ryegrass and also some of those products will have some broadleaf weed activity. So, you know, really, really exciting times to come in the next couple of years. Okay, moving on. So, post-emergent herbicides. There's herbicides available to use in pulse crops that you can't use in, in cereals, and they are your FOPs, your haloxifops and quizalophops, uh, clethodim and vitroxidim, and imis in the future, in lentils, beans, beans are coming in the future, and metribuzin in lentils, tifoid in chickpeas. So there's some herbicides there that you can't use in, in cereals, apart from the clearfield imis. And, you know, that, that allows you to tackle ryegrass. Now, the FOPs are not really working very well, you know, due, due to resistance across the entire country, apart from the very marginal Mali areas where the FOPs are still working, in most of the other parts of the country, you know, controlling ryegrass with um, haloxifop is, can, be, can be challenging. Um, but there are a lot of opportunities through resistance testing where those herbicides will work. But if I did, hadn't done a resistance test, I would be a little bit skeptical because you can get a complete failure. So resistance testing important because it, it finds you, it, it enables you to find those, those situations where one of these herbicides will work. But I wouldn't be doing that without a resistance test because it's not a fair bit. Now, clethodim and butroxidim, a lot's been said about those, and we'll say a bit more about those in the next slide. So here's a, here's a nice situation of a lentil crop where we've got some pretty big ryegrass there. Now, uh, it, it's a big ask for a herbicide to, to try and control these kind of weeds. So, you know, what do you do? Do you hit them with a litre of gloves of, um, of select? Should you have applied 500 mils of select early on in the season when the, the seedlings were young and then come back a second time and apply another 500 mils of, of clethodim or butroxidim? You know, that's there's different scenarios there. Some growers like to leave as many weeds, germinate as many as possible and hit them at one time. But what we've, we've been seeing even with um, wild radish is you've got to have several applications of a herbicide Hitting weeds at a younger stage works much better than trying to get them all at one stage, even with a higher rate. Now, even if they're you know, resistant to herbicides, if they're young, young weeds can sometimes be outright killed, even, even though they may have group A target site resistance. If they've got weak resistance, young seedlings can be killed, whereas if they get a few tillers on them, they're invincible with the same rate of herbicide. So hitting them first up and then if there's a supplementary germination hitting them again with another rate of herbicide is is definitely a lot better than trying to get them all at one stage um, because it's just really challenging for herbicides they're not made to tackle these big weeds hey, what about just for that particular weed on your screen there is there any difference between spraying that with like you said, say 500 mils now and then 500 mils in two weeks as compared to one hit of one litre. Is there any um, benefit of splitting it or is it really just a, a volume yeah, of product? I think here we're in that second phase. So young seedlings are not no longer young seedlings, they're large plants. And so at this stage here, you'd be better off hitting it with a, with a high rate to try and take, take that out. Um, if this was, yeah. you know, four weeks before and yeah that, that those plants would have been a lot younger and yeah it would have been a lot better to go with a 500 but at this stage here you've got to go with the full the full hog um go the full rate. what i've seen in western australia if any ryegrass that we've got the vast majority of it if you you just couldn't kill a ryegrass plant as big as the one on your screen with clethodim for most growers these days yeah that's right now if, if that was sensitive it would, it would take it out um, but any any kind of resistance, any low level resistance, then that thing will definitely survive and set seed and cross pollinate with its neighbours and increase the levels and mix the mutations and then just increase the level um, a lot more for next year. 
Okay. So here's some data that I, I think I showed at my one of the webinars I did a couple of years ago on where I, I took sort of 20 odd populations of ryegrass and sprayed them at the three leaf stage, completely healthy plants with uh, factor and with clethodim to see, you know, is factor better than clethodim? You get these questions all the time and really you can't say one from the other. You know, sometimes butroxidim will work better and other times higher rate of clethodim will work better. But what is very clear is as that rate increases, control does increase. So, you know, the, the, gra the table shows that very clearly. Mixing the, the two, I haven't got any data for mixing the two, but that's also very good. But, you know, I'd say here that with a thousand of, of clethodim, it's double the recommended field rate, but we are controlling a fair bit of ryegrass there compared to using, you know, the lower rate, the 300 mil rate or the 100 mils of 100 grams of factor. It's much higher rate. So going as high as possible. Now, remember, these are three leaf seedlings okay and even those are starting to survive so if you are talking of you know tillering plants once they get to that mid to late tillering it's going to be really hard to take them out so just a bit of a demonstration that even on on really healthy seedlings three leaf stage we can't always control them because of of resistance so in the paddock you know we've got other stress factors we've got frost we've got nutritional stresses we've got moisture stress all of those add to the start chipping away and making that herbicide less effective so if it's got any level of resistance it's really not going to um to be outright controlled so just um just to clarify pete um 180 of factor equivalent rate of select is 500 is that right uh, that more or less it's showing that yeah more or less but you know in some cases you get one better than the other and it really did depends on the on the mutation or the or the, the combination of mutations in in a single individual yeah, but, you know, rule, rule of thumb from all that shows that your 500 to select on these is about as equivalent as a 180 factor but for most of those populations there isn't actually if you compare the 180 with the 500 there's actually not much in it no no spot on So yeah, I mean, just I just wanted to do a, a trial just to show um, to show get a bit of an understanding of what's happening, and I think this table is giving us a bit of an insight of a trial done at the same time where you got all the populations at the same time, and just to see how these herbicides work. You know, in these trials, like susceptible ryegrass, we can kill with 50 mils of clethodim, so it, it's very susceptible. So. For them, oh, these guys here. Old days. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that, that ship sailed a long time ago. Mm, we killed big ryegrass with uh, 100 mils. <laughs> yep. Yep. Oh, yeah. Acceptable. That's right. Just shows you how many, you know, how many resistance genes have popped through the system. A little bit on late season seed set control. So here we've got some very large distinctions between trying to do this in cereals and do this in pulses. So we've got the ability to use paraquat and paraquat is an excellent herbicide to control to sterilize seed. And it's got quite a large um, application window as well. So you can get very con good control with paraquat up to soft dough stage. Whereas with glyphosate, um, you know, milky dough, because it's a slow acting herbicide. So you, you apply the glyphosate and it takes a while to, to work. And while it's you know getting through the plant, the plant's maturing and um, it can be too late. So whereas paraquat bang works you know, almost immediately. And I'll show some information as well there that if you've got glyphosate resistance, then controlling an individual that's glyphosate resistant with glyphosate at that crop topping stage, you, you can't expect good sterilization and in fact it doesn't happen so if, if the ryegrass is resistant at the seedling stage it's resistant at the pollen stage as well so um, if there's any plants escaping through the season 
then what will happen is that if you apply glyphosate, you will sterilise all the non-glyphosate resistant plants, leave the glyphosate resistant ones um, to just fast track the resistance because they're the only ones flowering um, with viable pollen and you can fast track the resistance quite quickly. So a little bit more on that. So, <clears throat> yeah, a little bit on the late season control. It's been optimised in Australia. Overseas they use it more for desiccation, but here we use it for both desiccation and also trying to, as sort of the last strategy before, um, before while the crop is growing to control some weeds for next year, the seed set. And it's quite varied. You can use it in, in cereals to control wild oats. There's, there's various ways, but in, in pulse crops, it's really um, applying the herbicide to sterilise the seed. So, uh, yep, so flowering. Flowering is the most sensitive stage. It doesn't occur every year because you have to have the, the crop more advanced than the weeds and that doesn't always happen in every season. Then if, if you don't get that opportunity, then, then it's not, you can't use it for that year. Otherwise you could get hammer, hammer your yield. So usually rule of thumb, whether there's a dry finish, the crop tends to mature a little bit faster than the weeds, and that is often more suitable for using these practices compared to a dry, a uh, wet finish. And we had one, we had one last year, but hadn't had one of those for a long time. And that's where you get crop maturity similar to the weeds. So you don't want to be spraying weeds um, while your crop is flowering at that very early stage because you can have some real damage occurring. So rule of thumb, you know. That that's when you should really be doing it. And most of the people who are listening in the audience are experts at you know when to actually do this. So with paraquat, we're applying it you know four to eight hundred mils, uh, controlling weed escapes. If you, the higher the rate, the better is the seed set control. So it's registered in quite a few crops, quite a few uh, le, le, uh, chickpeas and beans and peas, lentils, le, vetch. And lupin, so there's quite a big number of pulse crops there. Um, yeah, reduction. You want to try and yeah, sterilize, separate the crop from the from the weeds in terms of growth growth stage, and it may not be practical in one year. If you get it wrong, yep, yeah, we've had things of excess of 25% yield loss. So you don't want to to be in that situation, especially if you've had a hard year already with all the other factors chipping away not registered for cereals or canola, paraquat. So it's a big no-no there. Uh, then you flip with glyphosate. We've got New Farm, Weedmaster DST, and the Sinochem Roundup Ultramax, both registered. The target there is for your wheat and barley to be at 28 moisture. Barley was just included last year in that, in that in that situation. So that sort of equates to a late dose stage. In canola, 20% seed colour change. Uh, with hay and silage, you've got some options there as well. That's used successfully. You can use it in chickpeas and lentils, beans, field peas. But if you're intending to use your crop for seed production or sprouting, it's a big no-no and it's always if you're targeting a specific market it's important to look at the the rules there for those crops but you know it's a very it's a very important way of sterilizing seed and as i said earlier remember if you've got glyphosate resistance you're not going to get sterilization of those those seeds so almost almost done now so we've done some work with crop topping of canola which showed that as you increase that rate of glyphosate, you get a huge uh, reduction in, in seed set control, in seed set. So, you know, from 1.4, you get about 50% viable seed. That's at 4.1, you, you've got about 20%. So the higher the rate, the better it is for reducing that, that viable seed.
And do you know the timing that that was applied, Pete? Yep, that was applied at the perfect timing um, at the this flowering stage of the rye grass. And just, yep, I'll let you keep going. We've got a question coming in then, and, and anyone else out there, Pete's nearly finished. So if you've got any yeah, questions. This last, slide, this last slide. So this is just to show you the, the trial that we did last year. We did a trial along a, a fence line which had glyphosate resistant ryegrass and we, um, we were very, went in and cropped up at the, the perfect stage and found that, you know, we sprayed at flowering stage, sprayed at the milky dough stage, and even at the flowering stage, 20% uh, of the seed was sterilized. 80% you know, was viable. So not, all, not every individual was glyphosate resistant. And that's why you got some sterilization there. But 80% of that seed was healthy and viable. And would, next year, this year, is going to set seed, uh, germinate, and yeah, continue the process. So very important factor to, to look at. Right, P, I'm going to leave it there because, um, yep, that's it. Right, I ask questions yeah, my voice. I can hear my voice rapidly going. Yeah, no worries. We'll leave you in peace. We've only got one question, but just that last slide, Pete, that um, was something that you and I discussed and uh, and yep. wondered if there was a chance of uh, getting some pollen, pollen sterilisation. So you've gone out and done that uh, yep. at the end of last year, I take it, and that's right. And found, um, as other studies have found, I think, have they that that um, the pollen is resistant to? Yep, Chris Chris Preston did some work oh, years and years ago. Um, he did it on a on a glyphosate resistant population that was target site resistant, and he found exactly the same that the the pollen the pollen was not killed and uh, it, it set viable seed. Now with glyphosate resistance, we know that the most common mechanism is the translocation mechanism. This particular um, population um, is is uh, resistant to via the translocation mechanism. So we had uh, Ben Fleet conducted the field trial in, in the paddock and Jenna Malone did the um, enzyme molecular work, um, the, the biochem work, and so she found this translocation mechanism. And so we did the, the seed dormancy um, germination. So it was a multiple effort, but we just wanted to show that in the most common mechanism out there, how would what effect is this having and, and you know it, it's no surprise that this is what we found yeah and yeah that's great work and the other question that i get asked is in relation to clethodim on this same thing is if we have clethodim resistant ryegrass can we stop seed set with clethodim are you aware of any research there um yeah we've done some work with group a herbicides um oh, 30 years ago i reckon on ryegrass and found that that ryegrass po um, pollen was resistant to group A herbicides if if the plant was a resistant. So, yep, exactly the same as what we found with glyphosate. We have shown yeah. it with group A resistant ryegrass that uh, applying group A's does not control that, does not kill that pollen. Yeah, I see as much, but you can only uh, have a bit of wishful thinking. Um, now, right. there is question come in um, and that question was what about adding butroxidim and I'm assuming this is adding butroxidim to clethodim. Is there any safety or any benefit of, of adding butroxidim? Um, in, in some cases we find it can be of benefit. Um, in other cases just using a um, high rate of clethodim produces the same effect. Yeah okay. So certainly the word synergy wouldn't be um, the word to use, it might be just additive, is that right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, spot on. And, and group A resistance is, is very complex. Um, there's seven sites and at each site you can have different mutations and you can have multiple uh, mutations in the same plant. So if you put all those three factors together, it becomes quite complex and really depends what an individual has on whether, say, a litre of clethodim or 500 of clethodim plus 180 of factor would work better. It really depends on, on the combination of mutations in that plant. Yeah. Right. Oh, well, thanks very much for that, Pete. It does really yeah. go into those, uh, I think you identified five different times of the year to attack weeds. And as yeah. you said at the beginning, uh, it 
once upon a time we could just attack weeds at one time of the year and yeah. it all worked. Uh, but nowadays with resistance, uh, it's all about attacking at that, those multiple timings. And I really get the feeling that people that are really taking it on and, and are taking this approach of, you know, knockdown pre-M, post-M, seed set control, harvest weed seed control, are really having a win in terms of the seed bank and also slowing down the evolution of resistance. Have you got any other comments on, on what you've seen where people have adopted, you know, targeting multiple hits in one year? Yeah, the, uh, um, the, re the real benefit is at least having at least, you know, three of those, three of those practices that do work in there. You know, we're not saying to use all five every year because it's just, you know, a bit crazy. But if you, if you start getting those numbers down, then, then you can, you know, slacken off a little bit as long as, you know, the practices that you are doing are working. So it's, it's just, that's, that's the most important bit, you know, I think it's good to, to let the audience know that we're not saying to use five timings every year on every, in every paddock. It's just to, to, if you got to blow out, really get on top of it and then to maintain it, you know, you don't have to use all five obviously, but just make sure that what you're doing is working. That's the important bit. Righto. And I've got one more question here that's come in. Um, the question says, I believe that people mix plethidim and haloxifor. When they do that, the rates are being cut. Should they be using full rates of each? So that's clethidim. Um, yeah, absolutely. Because usually with ryegrass, the haloxifop is not doing a lot. Um, it's usually just the clethidim. So the haloxifop is there really for brome, barley grass, wild oats, uh, voluntary cereals, and and the and the clethidim is is there for um, you know the ryegrass, the the di weak dim resistant ryegrass. So yeah, you got to really keep that rate up. Another thing that I sort of was thinking about as well is that we've got some evidence that there may be some antagonism also between um, clethidim and some fungicides as well. So you know the more you mix together in with your cletho, you, you're not going to get the full effect as you will if you just use the product alone. So it works to its Best, best of its ability. You know, when we do our spray trials, we're not mixing anything else. So if you're trying to mix too many things together, they're going to start antagonizing each other. And so you could be using a, you know, a full rate of clethidim and you go, well, you know, my weeds have survived, but I did a resistance test with you and um, it showed that it killed my weeds. So that's another thing to think about is antagonism, trying to keep um, the, the herbicide mixture as pure as possible. And, and so, so it works. With, best of its ability and, and I know some growers that have have spoken to me and they've said that they're using some of the herbicides alone only spraying them because they've seen them work a lot better than when they've mixed them up with other pesticides they've seen reduced yeah. um, re results so that's a really really important factor at the end here yeah I certainly had a um, clethidium atrazine mix go pear-shaped when I was a young agronomist and um, oh. I learned the lesson the hard way back then and um, it doesn't always happen, but when it does, um, it's pretty painful. Uh, there's yeah. a follow-up question to the clethidim haloxifop mix, and that is, if you do mix them, which oil? Have you got any thoughts on that, Peter, or is that better for the uh, industry? Yeah, I'm not too, yeah, not, not sure on that one. Okay. Uh, but, you know, I guess most of the oils should be all right. You know, Hasten should be all right. And, you know, Yadigal and Supercharger, they should all work pretty much the same. Righto. Well, thank you very much, Pete. Now, stay on the line, but uh, in yep, case there's more questions. But you, a minute ago, you said it was crazy that you don't want to do all five uh, timings uh, in one year. Well, we've got a crazy farmer on the line, Lance Turner, who is doing seven hits at ryegrass in one year in lupins. And um, Jess, if you can hand over control to Lance now, um, we'll hear from Lance about how he manages to do that um, uh, without it sort of breaking the bank and without um, it, it being too difficult. I mean, he had, when I say seven hits, uh, you'll see that Lance isn't doing seven different timings necessarily, but um, you will see that it is quite possible to um, to get multiple hits. So how are you going there, Lance? Are you, um, are you able to change over to presenter and, uh, and tell us a bit about your farm and 
and how you're getting multiple hits in lupins. Yeah, um, I'm here. I presume you can hear me. Yep. And well, I'm just, just, yeah, no. You can see the screen? Uh, not just yet. All right. Let's, do I have to do anything for the to, for the screen? I think Jess um, was going to hand over, and you should have to click on Show My Screen when it pops up. Okay. Um, so click on that. Yep. Yep. We've got a second. It should be coming through just now. Beautiful. You're on, Lance. So you might have to click in the middle of that screen uh, and then be able to use your arrow keys. But yeah, if you can just tell us quickly a little bit about your farm. And we've got about 10 minutes left. So uh, if you, uh, yeah, maybe a quick overview, but then run through how you get those seven hits. That'd be great. Yep, no worries. All right, thanks, Peter. But um, yeah, look, we, we're no different to anyone else in the broad acre timings, everything. So, you know, it's, this is a quick picture there. We're um, east of Pingley um, and also east of Corrigan, two totally different farms. One's low rainfall, heavy country, one's duplex sandplain. Um, we also run a chaff cart. Now, we did a rim workshop um, several years ago and we were, we were just cropping wheat and lupins in a wheat lupin rotation. Um, probably 20 odd years ago and we, we've been continuous crop since 1990 and when I did that rim workshop we were going to be pretty much out of the game with chemicals and all that sort of stuff but every time I brought a chaff cart into the uh, program we, we were going to keep keep cropping but I didn't want to do a chaff cart because uh, you know um, the problems that they had at the time and that sort of stuff so we sort of modified one and came up with this system and at the same time we bought in you know um, barley where we can use higher rates of trifluralin, um, canola, we hadn't grown canola before and you know, we still got lupins as a pretty big part of our program. Uh, we do run two chaff carts on two different headers. Um, Rightio, this is where a lot of our, our farms at now, that's two different varieties so we pushed the GPS apart a couple of feet, we we're bulking up a new variety so you can see the gap there, there's, there's no weeds. Um, you know, so that's what probably 80% of our, our farm is like now. Um, another one there just with a, a miss, um, you know, and usually when you miss, you know, that crop's all about really come into ear and usually when you get a miss, you get, they get full of weeds. Um, yeah, so that's just a, a quick overview of where our farm's at. Um, lupins, right, when we grow lupins, more often than not we, um, you know, we dry seed because it's a timing issue. And so we'll put out our trifluralin. Now for a long time, we didn't put trifluralin with lupins because we wanted to not use it every year. But in actual fact, nowadays we, we use it all the time. So um, I'll explain why as we go. So trifluralin's in there. there there's, there's one hit at the ryegrass. Simazine is, um, is in there. So they, you know, obviously, so the trifluralin and simazine work together. You know, it's all numbers, all about numbers. And because we dry seed, often we get, you know, a, a rain to germinate the lupins, but it will bring up all the, you know, self-sown cereals and all that sort of stuff as well. And if it's quite dry and the simazine's not really starting to work properly, we'll come in with targa and, um, you yeah, know, that will calm those, uh, you know, cereals down. But also, if there's any ryegrass there, the targa, you know, even if it only takes out a few percent, and like we have it take out the odd few percent here and there, one or two, um, you know, plants here and there. So there's another hit at it. Then you have select. Um, you know, so we're coming with the normal timing of select and we we'll use up to a litre. So that'll get a really good hit at it. So now we're up to four hits. And then later in the season, we'll do a, a um, like a crop top. So, you know, getting your seed set control. So anything that's survived, um, you know, we've then uh, done the, the, you know, the seed set control. And then at the end of the day, we're backing it up with the chaff cart. So there's six hits. We've had of those weeds and we haven't even touched a knockdown. So if we get a year where we get an early break, um, we get the double knock. So, you know, there's um, glyphosate, there's a seventh hit, but, you know, that one's back at the start. And then a double knock with a parapot, um, you know, is, is eight hits you're getting at those one weeds in that crop. And um, so that's why we target, um, you know, the, the crops. The, the pulse crop there, yeah, and, and to a certain degree, canola is similar. We desiccate the canola and, and that, but you've got the same sort of hits, but not the, the same robust rates of select. So that's the, you know, in our pulse side of it, how we can, um, you know, get the hits at it. So that's 
I don't know what picture's up next, but that one there's where the, um, you, you know, it's just the headland. I'm standing on the headland there and the air seat has been switched on a bit late and the GPS has, you know, taken 20, 30 metres to pull back on the line. But that's in Lupins and that's the weed situation there. Um, yeah, I don't know where I've got any more pictures or if there's any more. Have you got any questions, uh, Pete, that you want to touch on? So we don't have a lot of time. No, uh, you're right. The other slides are just what you've already said. So that's fine. You can just leave it there. But um, Lance, can you just reflect back to when you were growing lupins in the 90s or even the 80s and then you, you found your problems with resistance? Would it be fair to say back then it probably was just something like simazine pre and then a FOP? post emergent would that have been about the summation of the ryegrass control yep yep definitely we, we've pretty much always dry seeded lupins so it was always just put the lupins in um yeah yeah um simazine uh we did have atrazine in there for a little while but when we started growing canola we took the atrazine out because we don't want to you know load up the rotation um was our thoughts for trefland too but the the trifluorum we've kept in there yeah so it was pretty much just the one spray and then then harvest um and you know, spread everything back out. No, no harvest weed seed control or anything like that. So that was when we, you know, and that was easy farming. That was it. Was what wasn't wheat was lupins, and what wasn't lupins was wheat. Yeah, and I mean, I I was just reflecting on the why the northern region of WA had one of the world's biggest resistance problems, and it was lupin wheat as well. And that was the equation. You know, it was simazine pre, uh, a fop post, and. Um, and that was all you really needed to worry about. Um, just one other question, and I'll ask this of Peter Butsalis. Pete, Lance had troubles with um, with hoe grass many years ago, uh, but now says he still gets some ryegrass control with Targa. So can you just explain to us the difference in the resistance mechanism where they're both FOP herbicides, but yep. the Targa um, managing to kill hoe grass resistant ryegrass? Okay, can you hear me? Yep, gotcha. Okay, no, I didn't know I was, I didn't know I was on speaker. I was luckily I didn't say anything else. <laughs> um, okay, well, hoe grass is targer is a herbicide and and verdict as well. They're not metabolized, um, unlike herbicides such as hoe grass and topic, which are used in cereals because the cereals are able to metabolize. Um, those those herbicides, Targa, Verdict, and even Clethodim, they all work, you know, the, the same because they can't be metabolised. They work a lot better on group group A resistant uh, ryegrass. So, and we've always seen this that even though they're FOPs, there are differences between the FOPs. The weaker FOPs are the ones that are selective in cereals. You know, your wildcat, your topics, your hoe grasses, your decisions. And the stronger ones are the ones that are not selective in cereals, such as your targets, verdicts, and and then you go to your, your dims. So, and then that's the reason really why, because they can't be metabolized. So if there's any metabolic resistance early on, you would have had hay grass resistance early on, and that was probably due to um, enhanced metabolism. Because your targets and your verdicts can't be metabolized, they would have worked, and that's what was happening there. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that, Peter. I was just talking to Lance about it the other day and thought we'd bring that up. Yeah, yeah. and so Lance, um, that's a great summary. Um, you're still growing lupins. Um, it was 20, well, 25 probably years ago now since um, you first hit the problems with resistance and probably back then you really questioned your ability to keep continuous cropping and, and I think you said you've been uh, continuous cropping ever since. How confident are you about the future of continuous cropping with the systems that you're using? Yeah, well, I, we can't, well, that's how, where the bulk of our crops are at now. So, you know, they're the cleanest they've ever been. It's a whole systems approach. It's not any one uh, thing is a, is a silver, you know, silver bullet. Um, yeah, so confident, yep. Um, yeah, we, like you say, we sort of looked at it for a while and thought, you know, we're going to have to go back. But, you know, we've been continuous since 1990 and back here on the, the home end, yeah, we haven't taken a paddock out of crop um, in all that time. It's been 100% crop the whole time, and we just don't have the weed pressure. I mean, I can, I can, uh, yeah, I can always take you to a dirty patch here or there, or, you know, which might be gravel ridge or where the field bins sit and the trucks and chase have been run it all down. But you know, on the whole, that's what what it's like. You have to walk a long way to find, you know, um, the odd weed. 
Um, canola is probably our weak point um, because of the you know the amount of um, select we can put on it. Um, yeah, so that's that's probably the weak point at the minute, and there's a bit more in in that. But we still don't have the pressure. You you only find individual plants, not um, not patches in general. Yeah, and I had a farmer come in to me a couple of years ago. He said wheat is the hole in the bucket for him. He he said he's using a pre-emergent, and then that's it, uh, and he's not getting any crop topping. Um, he this particular farmer wasn't using harvest weed seed control, but that is another hit. But it really did just show how something like pulse crops can be used where you just can get these multiple hits and it, it is harder in, in other crops. Sure, in canola we can get a, a crop top with glyphosate late, um, but, uh, but, and, you know, but in, in wheat and it, is, it is much harder to get those, those multiple hits in that, in that one season.